Welcome to the Alternative Healers Coffee Chat. I am Janelle Mulligan. Uh, Life Meteor empowers people struggling with overthinking to get to the root cause and strengthen their foundation in self-awareness, confidence, and agency. And the purpose of the podcast is to acquaint listeners to different modalities and empower them on their healing journey. And with me today is Dr. Z. Um, he is a chiropractor who wants to, people to heal from illness, injury, and trauma, rest and feel at home in their body. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks. Solid introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you kind of nailed where I'm coming from. Perfect. Thank you. Because I was looking through your website and I was like, I want to find the right words. And and your pretty much opening line to your website was like, oh, that's Exactly. Beautiful and perfect. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Dr. Z, um, and kind of how you got to this point in your journey? Uh, <laughs> sure. Start with the easy ones. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I am a chiropractor uh, by trade. I've been practicing in San Francisco since 2012. Um, I spent uh, eight months trying to practice in Oakland before I moved. So I've been, I've been a chiropractor since the end of 2011. Um, uh, before being uh, a chiropractor, I was doing some massage, quite a bit of craniosacral therapy, some hypnosis, some neuro-linguistic programming. I've dabbled in lots and lots of different healing modalities. And the reason that I have pursued chiropractic the way that I did not pursue a lot of those other ones with the sort of professional focus on uh, on making a career out of it is because I found that it gives me both the tool set and the licensure and the background and education to be able to really talk about the kinds of healing that I'm the most excited about, the kinds of changes that I'm the most interested in helping people make um, in lots of different languages. Um, I don't mean I speak a whole bunch of different languages. It's mostly just English and Spanish. Um, and my Spanish is <laughs> um, <laughs> sufficient. My Spanish is sufficient, but I mean, like I can speak in different metaphorical frameworks really easily. So, um, before I even went to chiropractic school, I was doing a bunch of craniosacral, um, with a little bit of Reiki thrown in. So very energy work folk. Yeah. Work. Um, and I called the school and I said, I, I'm thinking about attending, but my main concern is that I don't really want to get laughed off campus for what I already know how to do. Cause what I already know how to do works. Um, and I just, I want people to be able to, like, I want to be able to have conversations where people will hear me out. Um, and am I going to get laughed at for doing energy work? And they said, no, I really don't think you are. Um, we will here frame it primarily about the function and operation and integration of the nervous system rather than something immaterial. But baked deep into chiropractic philosophy is this idea that the brain and its natural and innate intelligence systems uh, are in charge of taking the immaterial, like imagination, and turning it into material, like actual movement. Um, and so if you're doing energy work, there may be some translation to do, but it will fit here. And I was like, I'll be there tomorrow, and jumped right in. Um, and so now when people come into my office, uh, because of the sort of chiropractic framework uh, and that deep philosophy about the intelligence of the body being made manifest as the body and its behaviors, um, uh, you know, I can talk to almost anybody about their health and well-being and find a way to rationally, reasonably talk about what's going on, but also emotionally, metaphorically related to how they really feel about the world. So that's my that's my main um, interest and the reason that I, I practice chiropractic um, as my primary modality to help heal. Um, you may pick up just from the way I framed that whole thing that prior to uh, being a chiropractor and doing craniosacral and uh, uh, all the rest of the modalities that I studied, I also got a bachelor's and master's in linguistics. <laughs> and, and so the, um, the sense of we have this meaning making machine um, that works with and um, operates on symbols um, that also operates the meat. Yep. I, um, I, I refer to it as the meat mech. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's very much where I'm coming from is, is recognizing that um, the, the body and the mind are both things that the brain are in charge of. Um, and 
Therefore, if I can easily nudge the mind stuff, you know, I can just get up in the morning every day and say something kind to myself in the mirror. It might have an impact on the body. And if I can easily nudge the body stuff, you know, I can get up every day and take five minutes to stretch and warm up and calm myself and ready myself for the day. It can easily have an impact on the mind stuff too, because we're always just talking about the brain. Yeah. Uh, and it seems we're doing one or the other, just the brain or just the body. And it's that interconnection and recognizing they are so influenced. And I absolutely adore how you're approaching it. I actually studied to be an attorney before <laughs> I got into healing. I, I keep natural <laughs> connection. Yeah. Makes yeah. much sense. Linguistic. <laughs> um, but that's why, you know, the fact that you're talking about linguistics, the being able to be that bridge um, to people who are either more kind of left brain and give me the logic and science and or those that are the more spiritual and say, I see how my energy isn't flowing and you can bridge both sides of that for them. And that just <laughs> literally gives me chills. Um, well, they're just two different ways of talking about the same experience, right? One of them is sort of more external observer where like I can measure and repeat and compare and and. Uh, replicate uh, the observations. And that's the sort of scientific uh, approach. And the other one is the internal observer where I can feel and notice and intervene and feel and notice again. Um, do they, they don't end up in the same place, but they're both valid tools to understand yourself. Yep. And the, as you take time and you kind of work them closer and closer together, they'll start partnering. Um, totally. And you know, I think a lot of people in the collective are starting to see that and starting to see the benefit. And I think it's a movement growing more and more. And um, you're giggling. I have personal beef with Rene Descartes. <laughs> I have personal beef with Rene Descartes. So I, don't, most people, <laughs> I know. I, okay. I don't even know that name. So please short, tell me. Short ride. You you are familiar with uh, Rene Descartes' work. I assure you for, if only this quote, um, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, is Rene Descartes. Okay. The, the, the problem with Rene Descartes is that he came to that conclusion because he kept sitting there going, what, ca what else can I doubt? What else can I doubt? Well, I can't doubt that I'm thinking. Um, but like, I don't know about you. I can't doubt that I have a body. Like I can't doubt that. Like, and yeah. somehow he, he could, but thinking he couldn't doubt. Um, the, the core of one of his major philosophical contributions to Western thought um, is uh, mind-body dualism, that the mind and the body are two totally separate universes that have nothing to do with each other. Um, this was Rene Descartes, um, and he put this um, idea forth into, into Western thought, and it just caught like wildfire that like, well, yes, of course, that's why we have all of this emotional detachment in France and England. It's Cartesian. It's the value is separate yourself from your own feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so I have personal beef with Rene Descartes. Um, and I'm on, I want a little bit of a mission. Like we're going <laughs> to, we're going to, we're going to correct this error. I like that. I had never even, like you said, I've heard the bits and pieces, but two and two never correlated. And I'm right there with you. Like, can I, I'll just like hang out right behind you. And <laughs> because you're right, it's, we're so much more. Um, and, you know, then you add not only just the mental and the physical, but the spiritual and the energy and, and all of that. And, you know, we, no one has to believe in all of it. And, they can see the benefit to all of it, I think. I think there's something really valuable in, there's something about the phrase believe in that um, makes me want to carefully construct a frame around our conversation. Please. Um, which, is say, which is to say like, um, you know, a thing that I run into often, you know, because because chiropractors, despite the fact that like I'm licensed as a primary care physician in California, um, uh, we have a reputation, right? And the reputation is as fringe or as quackery or whatever it is. Okay, fine. Um, but um, the, I've had people say to me, I don't believe in chiropractic. And for the life of me, I can't figure out what they like you don't have to I'm not selling you nothing I'm not I'm not selling you on an idea um at least 
not at first. Like the idea I'm selling you on is that your body is self-organizing, knows how to heal, has self-corrective mechanisms in place. And if those self-corrective mechanisms aren't self-correcting, that's the problem. And so the solution is not the ways in which your body is failing to self-correct the symptoms that result. The problem is it's not doing the self-correction. What's in the way of it self-correcting? Um, so you don't have to believe in another person's experience, yep. but you do have to believe that they have an experience. And you might say, well, I had this spiritual experience where I was visited by this being and this being spoke to me and I learned something from it. And I might not think that that's possible, but I know you had an experience and I might compulsively need to frame it in terms that I can reckon with where like, well, you had some kind of emergent awareness arising from your subconscious putting together and you put a frame on it internally that made it make sense and be relatable to you as a being speak. I, I can rationalize almost anything, <laughs> but the important thing is not whether or not you and I agree about the mechanism by which you understand yourself. Yep. But I... We have to agree in order to treat each other as human beings, as people, we have to agree that you understand yourself. Even if you understand yourself through misinformation, you're still experiencing something that's real for you. And so if I come at you with like, well, that's not right. There aren't any, there aren't any angels talking to you. It's not helpful. Yeah. Uh, whereas if I say, okay, I want to understand more about that because that can't happen in my universe, but I understand that it's happened in yours. I wonder what the experience is. Is there some common experience? Are you and I actually both capable of having that experience, but framing it, describing differently. it, differently, remembering it very differently? Um, and, you know, there are probably some experiences that like we're not both capable of having and that's okay too. Exactly. I, I absolutely adore how you put that. Um, so I have a term I use a lot, definitional differences. Sure. Um, and, you know, kind of to that, that thing, you can sometimes be talking the exact same thing and just using different terms. And, you know, the, the conflict is just in the misunderstanding of the terms. I'm, you mentioned that you've had people come to you and say, I don't believe in chiropractics. Yeah. What do they mean by that? What what are they not trusting I, in? Well, I think that there's a couple of answers I want to give. The first answer is something like what they're really saying is I'm scared. That's the first thing that they're saying. Um, the second thing that I think that they are saying is I've heard a bunch of stories about how chiropractic is dangerous or chiropractic uh chiropractors are are um swindlers or snake oil salesmen or whatever people have a lot of funny ideas some of which like i understand exactly how that happened there was a, a lawsuit that settled i think in the late 80s or early 90s uh between one of the major chiropractic associations and the american medical association where the american medical association lost because they had been literally trying to to stamp out our profession and there were internal memos that were found that were like we're going to destroy this profession um, because we have to be the ones that own health care um, and I think, wow, I didn't yeah, even know about of, that. And, and part of the, part of the way that worked was a whole bunch of relatively like I, I, libelous stuff being printed and slanderous stuff being said about, you know, um, the ways in which chiropractors can't be trusted. And it, it definitely had a lasting impact on our reputation in the public consciousness, um, uh, so some of like the feedback that I see, for instance, on my my TikTok, where people are saying like you can't trust this person, their fundamental position is what he's saying must be dubious because of his license, and that's the, that's as far as their logic has gotten because it's an emotional response, yeah, right. So yep. and the emotional response is, as I said before, fear, um, fear of the unknown, fear of danger, fear of uh, uh, something that they don't understand. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I get all of that. Um, and that said, I no longer really spend much time in my comments section. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and, and I get, again, being an attorney, I actually never practiced law yet. And yet being an operative word, because I ended up realizing I didn't like most attorneys. So like, I 
get the reputation and the stereotypes sometimes, but to, sure. you know, um, that, that kind of breaks my heart because also seeing how much benefit does come from chiropractic work and that, um, connection to the body because with it being such a main part of the nervous systems and how the nerves are communicating with the rest of you and and the energy flow and and all of that um you know the the benefits that come from it well so like let's let's pause there and spend a second with that i think um because i'm going to wager that a, a, a large chunk of your uh uh following um probably has some misunderstandings about even what chiropractic is and what it's for, because Please. I'm going to strongly suspect that at least a chunk of people listening to this are thinking chiropractors are back pain doctors. Yeah. And that's how a lot of them are. Right. Sell the, sell and the process. So first, let me tell you the story of chiropractic. So uh, the very first chiropractor was a man named Dee Dee Palmer. He and his son, BJ Palmer really created and developed the practice of chiropractic. Dee Dee was a magnetic healer, which from reading what he was doing sounds honestly, in my mind, a little bit like hokum, but he was looking for something that I think is true. He was sincerely looking for ways to help people heal, um, especially since this was pre-industrialization of medicine. And so we didn't like, there was a lot of medicine that was still like just past leech work. Um, <laughs> so, uh, cause it's 1895. Um, so D Palmer is in his uh, office, the janitor that comes and cleans his building is a man named Harvey Lillard. Uh, uh, Harvey is complaining one day about, you know, his neck is sore, um, but also mentions that he hasn't really been able to hear for the past 10 years since he fell off of a ladder. Like one, one ear completely deaf, the other one significantly uh, reduced he uh, hearing. And so Dee Dee says, well, I'm a healer. Does he know what he's doing? Mm -hmm. um, but here, lay down, let me take a look. And he he feels his back and says, well, your spine is all chunked up out of the way. Let me just wang on it real hard. Uh, yeah, right. And Harvey says, huh, I can hear the carriage in the street. That's new. Um, and so Dee Dee Palmer thought that he had discovered the cure to deafness. And, <laughs> and let me pause there and say, <laughs> any deaf listeners or followers of this program, I'm so clear that deafness is not a disability or an illness that has a cure. Like that's not a thing. So I'm clear about that, but here's the story. He, that's what he thought that he had discovered. Um, and, uh, and so he put out ads in newspapers all over the country saying, I can cure your deafness, um, bring your kids. And a whole bunch of deaf people showed up who wanted their hearing improved or hard of hearing people showed up who wanted their hearing improved. And none of them really got their hearing back except for Harley B. Lillard. But a lot of them had gastrointestinal problems clear up, balance problems clear up, uh, 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 chronic cough and other kinds of chronic illnesses started to get better. And he went, wait, maybe I found something else. Um, so Dee Dee coming from that magnetic healing background definitely stayed more on the I guess I want to say spiritual side of healing. His position was essentially that what chiropractic was for was clearing interference in the normal communication of your spirit, which uses your brain and nervous system as the medium by which to coordinate your body so that your spirit directly in touch with cosmic consciousness um, and just a little reflection of that is the thing that manages and manifests your body. And when you have distortions in the function of the nervous system in the form of literal fixations in the spine, um, where that means that your spirit, your innate intelligence operates over that with interference, mechanical material interference on the function of this otherwise pure and perfect spiritual idea. That's Dee Dee. BJ was like, okay, dad. Um, and so <laughs> BJ uh, growing up uh, again, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s was very fascinated by the scientific uh, revolution and the industrial revolution that had happened over the past several hundred years um, and definitely was a science guy. And so um, BJ was, I think, the first person to use x-rays to create a full spine um, x-ray picture of a human being um, and filed any number of like fascinating patents from 
If you've ever had a really old light switch that goes clunk, clunk, and makes a loud noise, well, he couldn't have that. It would make patients jump when he turned the lights off and he wanted them very still. So he patented the quiet light switch that most homes have now that like, like that kind of stuff, like patented all kinds of stuff. Um, and he really took the scientific observation piece seriously. And so would measure temperature control in the skin on various parts of the body to indicate which part of the nervous system is dominant, the, the sympathetic fight or flight part or the rest and di uh, digest parasympathetic part. Um, and so he really advanced the science of it. Um, he also maybe arguably tried to run his dad over with a car um that remains controversial but that's sort of that's sort of early story of chiropractic and it very much arises from an understanding that by correcting interference in the function of the nervous system in the the dynamic communication from the tips of the nerves to the center neural nervous system and back out again in that arc disruptions in that lead to negative health consequences um whether that is a chronic stress state, we might describe it in contemporary terms as um, having uh, having a, uh, uh, onboarded trauma responses in the sense of, you can see how my shoulders, if I'm stuck in this position, <laughs> I have fixed into place a certain amount of protective reflex. And this is precisely how I talk about it with my patients, is what we're really looking at is places where you're stuck protecting yourself from things that you needed to protect yourself from, but maybe don't anymore. And now those protections are causing problems. That's beautiful. Th that and thank you for that history. That that is so interesting. And I feel like it, in the context, like there are later um, evolutions of ch chiropractic thinking, especially in like the eighties and nineties when we started really getting into the insurance racket in the eighties, um, where it really became like evidence forward and evidence only, and therefore the only thing we really have evidence for is pain management, and therefore that's all we do. And that was sort of how we got pigeonholed like that. We sort of unfortunately. Oh ourselves into that corner. Um, but it's not the roots of chiropractic. The roots of chiropractic, like uh, the, one of the main reasons that we have nationally recognized licensure is because there was at least a very strong rumor and some pretty good circumstantial evidence that the 1918 flu pandemic, people who were under chiropractic care died less. Now, it's really hard to find concrete studies that show this because that's not really how health science was done in 1918. Um, yeah. But there are some good circumstantial, like here's a whole bunch of accounts and stories about like, just like I'm going to the chiropractor and I'm not, I'm not getting as sick as the people who aren't. Um, and what we know now from contemporary science is that there is a very direct link between the autonomic nervous system function, its operating level, how close to the, the fight or flight reflex versus the rest and digest, um, and its effect on the immune system. So that's not only like we have a bunch of stories about that, but we also have a plausible mechanism about that, even if we don't have verifiable data that conclusively says that. But that's part of how we got a good reputation is like, you know, you go to the chiropractor, you're not going to die of this flu. That that's a pretty good um <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, and I love that you do look at it from you know the trauma and recognizing how our bodies um act and interact and react. Um and I know you kind of have some parts of the different communities that hold a very special place in your heart and that you focus on. Is there any one of those or more that you want to talk about? Yeah, let's hit them. So uh, the, 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 the place where I have done most of my learning and work is really about chronic trauma responses. Um, there's a deep root just from the way I was talking about the history of chiropractic, where you can see where I'm coming from, where like if your body is stuck in protection, it might cause problems. Um, but in terms of, so like people who have trauma was the one of the first places that I was trying to really speak to like really, especially for people who are like, I feel like I have tremendous assistance to offer people who are like already in therapy or some equivalent trauma processing, trauma relearning thing where you can just calm the body down a little bit and then you have a little more room to navigate it. Um, but even nearer and dearer to my heart, when I opened my practice, I felt 100% clear that what I was creating was an LGBTQ forward 
healing space that was really designed for queer and trans people to come and feel at home and for cisgender and heterosexual people to show up and feel welcome in a space that was for queer and trans people. Um, and so I see people from all across all of those various spectra, um, but my heart has always been in the queer community um, and my service um, is in the queer community. Um, only recently, like not even a year ago, um, <clears throat> I started really recognizing, I'll tell you a story from my personal life, this will make sense. So been dating this guy for, it'll be, it'll be four years in August, three and a half years now. Um, and pretty early on in our relationship, he told me that he had ADHD and started talking about some of the things that came out of his ADHD. Um, and some of the stuff that he had learned that is pretty common with people with ADHD. Um, and so he was telling me about um, how his gut issues and his skin problems. And um, he was lucky because he had done a whole bunch of martial arts. And so he wasn't particularly clumsy, but lots of people with ADHD have a kind of hard time finding the edges of their body consistently. And so wang themselves into things or roll ankles really easily. And so then I started doing my own like research and reading about all of that kind of stuff. Um, and really connecting some of those dots and finding, oh, there's actually for really high correlation between um, Ehlers-Danlos and other connective tissue disorders and neurodiversity like ADHD and autism. Hmm, that's really interesting to me. Well, at one point while I'm doing this in a sort of more academic, abstract way, um, my, my partner also sort of starts chipping away about like, well, you know, you have a number of rather neurodivergent traits. And I'm like, yeah, I've all, often wondered about that, particularly since uh, my nephew is diagnosed as autistic and that tends to run in families. And, you know, it's really funny. He's, I, I said, all of my closest friends, especially all of my girlfriends in high school and college were always uh, women with ADHD. Um, and we both laughed and he said, oh yeah, all of my sister's friends are neurodivergent too. She's neurotypical, but all of my, my sister's friends are neurodivergent. It's almost like she has a neurodivergent shaped friend hole in her life and she just finds a friend to fill it. And I was like, yeah, I could totally relate to that. And he said, Sam, do you think your sister has ADHD? And I went, oh, <laughs> oh, this is in fact my whole family. It turns out we're just a bunch of neurodivergent people. Um, and when that clicked into place, I suddenly went, wait, what if I really pivot from just queer people broadly, for sure that to queer people and especially queer people and neurodivergent people. One of my patients introduced me to the word neuroqueer, and I felt like I had a, a niche for the first time after being in practice for 11 years. That's really just like in the last six months that I feel like I have that word. But when I look back at my practice for the past 11 years, it's you're, been- You're all, seeing a pattern. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a lot of neuroqueer people, neurodivergent, uh, uh, queer and trans people um, have been part of my practice um, the whole time. And so it's been very- encouraging, um, gr uh, gratifying, almost freeing to like, yeah. oh, these are who my people are. So I can just speak directly to them. And if I catch other people in that net, awesome. That is absolutely amazing and gorgeous. And I love how that played out for you, like so naturally, so heart led, um, you know, and, and it is with you know, social media and TikTok and the pandemic, you know, we're able to get educated about things that never would have crossed our minds necessarily, especially for generations like ours, where neurodivergence wasn't a real, a real <laughs> air quotes thing. Um, and now we start seeing these correlations and similarities. And it's like, there's a lot to this. And mm -hmm. I know um, also I have heard that there's, you know, that speculation of people who are in the LGBTQIA, you know, community also have a very strong correlation to neurodivergence and that there may in fact kind of be some connections. Yeah. Well, let's, let's think about it this way. Here's a simple way. When I was taking human anatomy classes, we were talking, of course, about average anatomy, but no human being actually really has average anatomy. Average, like when you look at the, the skeleton in the textbook or the muscles in the textbook, they're showing you averaged, averaged, meaning they're going to take the measurements for all of the things. They're going to take the way they generally appear and kind of conflate them together. Yeah. That's not really like 
that's not really how we show up in the world. Diversity is the norm. Variation is the norm. So that said, one of the things that we learned in anatomy was, you know, some people are born with different counts. Most of us have seven cervical vertebrae. Some of us might get an extra one or have six. Some of us, most of us have ribs that start on the thoracic spine. After seven cervical vertebrae, we have 12 with ribs attached, but some of us have ribs on the, on a couple of the cervical vertebrae too. Most of us have five lumbar vertebrae, but some of us have six or some of us have four because the fifth one has merged with the sacrum. Most of us have a merged, a fused sacrum composed of several different bones, three bones joined together, but some of us have space in them. Some of us even have all of our organs on the mirror opposite side of our bodies, right? Where the heart kind of tilts to the right and the spleen is on the, the right and the liver's on the left. That's, it blows my mind that that exists. But, and it comes with some health issues, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but like this kind of variation internally is the norm. Yeah. Why would it be different for our neurotypes? Yeah. Why would it be different for our behavior in the world and our impulses? And so if what we're actually, what I'm actually, I think saying is that variation is the norm. And the last thing, and this is where now I'm gonna tie the, the ribbon on, but what we were talking about before, uh, between neurodiversity and queerness. Um, the last thing is if you have a cervical rib that actually ups the odds for finding an extra lumbar vertebrae or another congenital variation, because the presence of one variation is predictive of further variations. Makes sense. Right? You don't usually have just one. You usually have a couple. Well, so I have a variant off of the standard typical of being queer. I also have some variants off of the standard typical in terms of how I conceptualize the world, process information, and create categories to sort uh, the world into. Mm -hmm. um, I also have some physiological anatomical variants, like my arms don't go all the way straight. That's, that's as straight as my arm goes. And I have some developmental variations. And the presence of one is predictive for the presence of others which for me neatly explains why we see a somewhat elevated uh, uh, correlation between queerness and neurodiversity, but also why we see a dramatically increased correlation between specifically neurodiversity and connective tissue disorders and other kinds of physical variations because the presence of one is predictive for the others. And that, that makes so much sense. I've never necessarily thought it that far into detail and that's absolutely beautiful and amazing my brain is like trying to put all the pieces together and see how it it then plays out um but that that just it was kind of mind-boggling and recognizing and embracing that kind of spectrum of humanity you know it, we aren't black or white you know we are all kinds of shades of gray in between and and now now we're back to a paragraph that i i uh we were in earlier about like we don't really have to believe in each other's stuff um, what I see fundamentally as the current sort of political crisis that's affecting my communities, right? There's, there's over 400 anti-trans bills that have been passed, um, uh, or have been proposed in this country just in this, this year. And we're, we're not even very far into April, right? So that means over a hundred a month, that means over two per state per month, um, which is really frightening. And what I see consistently being the, the argument is but trans people aren't real. And that's most of the position. It's like, we know that you don't really exist and you're only doing this in order to take advantage of people or to do some nefarious thing. But it essentially erases the existence of, of people. Yeah. Uh, and you don't have to, you don't have to agree that my way of life is an okay way for you and yours to be, but you can't disagree that I am this way. You don't like that's not a thing that you have access to. Yeah, um, and it very much reminds me of the anti uh, the anti gay kind of um, panics that we were in in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, They're very similar, which gives me a little bit of long term hope, um, but a lot of short term fear. Yes, people in my communities makes um, sense. So you know, all of this stuff is somehow connected, um, and I like to think about. 
that I recently went pretty viral on TikTok. I think it's how you found me was a one Probably. particular video talking about um, when people come into my office presenting with ADHD, I asked them about skin health, gut health, uh, uh, tight muscles and loose ligaments in the form of sprained ankles um, or, or random mystery bruises. Um, and all of those things correlate with various connective tissue disorders, particularly Ehlers-Danlos, which has a high correlation with neurodiversity. Um, and so a lot of people don't know that. Um, and I think fundamentally, like what made me say yes to even being here uh, and doing this interview was uh, I really wanted to have an opportunity to continue to let people know that your, your, your mind stuff your, you know, like the the mental and cognitive behavior, some of which you can control, much of which you cannot control. Um, uh, variation is the norm, and it will often come with bodily variations too. And currently, our healthcare system is not designed to communicate that to you. I agree, a hundred percent, and thank you. Um, now, with that said, do you have it for the listeners? Um, and, and I know kind of from a movement standpoint, it's kind of hard to explain to somebody who may be listening to the podcast, but are there things that as they're trying to process the stress of, of these bills and things that you're mentioning, because it is creating trauma responses in people, it is creating fear that they're going to hold in their bodies. Do you have any recommendations that of something easy they can do to help them reground in their body and, and create their sense of safety? So... Uh, yes, with a caveat. Um, Fair enough. Nothing works for everybody. Um, I have a whole plethora of different tools that I use uh, with my clients. And one of the fun and fascinating challenges about working with people with various kinds of neurodiversity is customizing the toolkit to fit them. Um, because um, here, let's try something together. Are are we doing just an audio podcast that people download later? Or, it's are both. It will be on YouTube and it will be... You know. Okay. So for the people who are listening along, I'll do my best to be really verbally clear for those of us watching, like we can, we can do this I'm gonna aim my camera slightly lower. So one of the things that I will teach people in order to soothe the nervous system and back it up from a chronic stress state um, is that we can use either very gentle movement or self touch to literally comfort the body and drop the nervous system away from the fight or flight response. So will you do this with me? Of course. Take the pads of your fingers, just the pity pads, and rest them on your breastbone near the top of the bone, right? There's the divot right below your neck. Mm -hmm. You're just going to rest your fingers lightly. I'm not pushing in. I'm just resting. And then I'm going to gently and slowly with pleasant light pressure, just draw out a line from the, from the center towards my shoulders. I'm just tracing a line or tracing maybe four lines with my various fingers, right? I'm just combing and the image i like to use here is like if i had a bunch of tangled up spider webs and i wanted to untangle them i don't want to press real hard i don't want to work real hard at it um if you've ever untangled uh headphone cables right if you pull on them hard it gets worse you're gonna break them but if you go gently okay and most people the majority will experience 20 to 30 seconds of this just working gradually down and then coming back up as soothing. You can sort of even hear it in my voice. Did you hear how it sort of rounded out some of the tension in my neck and throat just dropped out mm -hmm. because I took it out of a little bit of fight or flight response. That quickly can often really help people um, just knock the edge off. Did you notice a change in your brain while you were doing that? Yes, definitely. Tell me about it. What happened? Um, felt my shoulders relax more. I uh, felt my breathing slow and kind of regulate. Um, it kind of reminded me of petting a cat in some yeah. ways, like because yeah. okay. you you don't want to pet hard, but it's that just that slight sensation of um, mm -hmm. tingling and skin awareness, and it also kind of gave that that subconscious. It was more subconscious, or you know, lower conscious awareness of my skin being safe and the tingling and the, the, the that going on. You got it on the nose. So it's exactly that. And this is from a whole body uh, of, of work that I have um, that is really designed for creating a sense of safety in the body so that 
more work can be done, more change can be made. Because if it feels unsafe, your body, your brain is going to resist, right? Whereas if it feels safe, then you can keep going. The issue, now let me close the loop um, before we started, uh, is that for a lot of people who have sensory integration issues, particularly people who are therefore like on the autism spectrum, this kind of light touches. Can I swear? Yes, please. Fucking infuriating. It's just like yes. so stressful. Um, and it can, uh, thank God. Uh, and it can, <laughs> really, it can really like, this will make a lot of my autistic patients Crazy. wind up, just make some nuts. But what works better might be just still touch okay or a little compression and slow release mm -hmm. compression and slow release or even tapping and this isn't eft i don't i don't really know eft i've done a little bit before i think it's kind of helpful but like that's not what i'm talking about i'm just no. literally just in the same pattern instead of dragging and getting that constant skin input they're getting repeated but punctuated skin input, and that can help. So there is a degree of customization that can be done. But if you tried, if you tried brushing your your hands across your breastbone towards your shoulders, just across your pec muscles, and you found it soothing, you're in the majority. But if you did not find it to be soothing, if you found it to be infuriating, then you are in a non-trivial minority. Many people have that experience, and so then we would adapt and use different tools. Well, it, it's interesting you say that because I've, you know, heard about the butterfly touch, you know, and keeping mm -hmm. your hands at your chest and, and the, and that actually agitates me. That does. This one agitates mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Um, I yeah, don't know why. Everybody's <laughs> different. And so like part of my, part of my ethos of practice is to make sure that I have a diversity of tools that require a diversity of different that they capitalize on a diversity of different forces um, or force intensities so that I can meet people where they are yeah. um, and help them move their nervous system into new places. That is fantastic. And I think that is so needed, especially with how things have been for the last few years around here. <laughs> I mean, we're, we are in an interesting, we're in an interesting time. Um, so um yeah, I think I think the I, I had a thought. What was it? And one more thing I wanted to say about that. The touch and Yeah, I think the 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 way that ethos shows up in my office about having a diversity of approaches to make sure that I'm meeting people where they are is um also what gives me the ability to work with hypermobile patients. Again, because connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos, um, among a few others, uh, are really prevalent among uh, neuroqueer populations, um, that means that um, a lot of those typical chiropractic percussive forces that like, if you go to, to TikTok or to YouTube and you just search for chiropractic adjustment, what you will see will be designed to be surprising designed to elicit a shock response or possibly even a little bit of body horror response like oh god no which like you and i could have a separate two-hour conversation about my thoughts and feelings about <laughs> that trend. but some of those adjustments are fine right but none of those adjustments are fine for everybody yes um and so for hypermobile people i don't generally use that kind of force it's really dangerous it's contraindicated Literally in school, they taught us if you meet someone with Ehlers Danlos, you can't adjust them. Well, that's not right. You just can't adjust them like no. that. You have to adjust them based on their connective tissue response. And therefore, it's not going to be a percussive. It's going to be here, let's just move this gently and sway with it. I'm going to assume, kind of like when I when I'm adjusting a, a very late stage pregnant woman whose body has been flooded with progesterone and um, relaxin, and the relaxin is literally making all of the connective tissue softer. Mm -hmm. I don't need to slam on her pelvis. That's not polite. Um, <laughs> to nudge it because it will move because the connective tissue is less rigid. And so by the same token, that's how you approach adjusting hypermobile patients as well, is assume that the connective tissue will give way without the need for a percussive force. It generally will. And so scar tissue uh, remediation with a hypermobile patient is a little more like 
we're going to seesaw back and forth real gently again and again and again and again. I'm going to put a little pressure and then we're going to let it go. And generally people get improved mobility, um, improved nervous system function. I even just recently started a, a patient. So this patient told me that when she was in utero, her mom was doing a lot of cocaine. And so she came into the world with a lot of just automatically came in with health, a bunch of health problems. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the most dramatic, and she's very hypermobile, so I am not racking and cracking her. We're going real slow and gentle. And she said, after the first adjustment, she went home and a little, a little graphic, but uh, she went home and she pooped by herself without taking laxatives and without using, she had a mechanical like hook scooper thing because she was so chronically constipated that she oh just couldn't pass her own feces. And she did. And she's like, well, that's weird, but okay, whatever. And then after the second adjustment, it happened again. And now she's regular for the first time in her life um, because the nervous system wasn't communicating correctly because all of, everything had braced down around that hypermobility and that early chemical assault. So now she's regular. She looks like, she's like, I don't even know how to, what to do with myself. Like, this is so different. I can only uh, imagine. Oh my goodness. Right. And that's, that's, this is one of those really complicated situations where there's the hypermobility, which means that I can't use big forces. There's the digestive system issues, with, which suggests sort of complex issue going on in the, the lower body. Um, and then there's that very early chemical trauma um, that like, you just have to create a safe environment in order for anything to happen. But that also means that she's really responsive. As soon as parts of her body feel safe that have never really felt safe before, things move, things change, and she heals. That is a fantastic example. And oh, this made me cry when she told me, which is a strange, a strange thing in retrospect. Like, oh wow, you told me you could poop and I cried. But also No. <laughs> <laughs> the, right? the fact that it was so almost life-changing for her, like how often do you per se get something that is that life-changing? Because we don't necessarily think about bowel movements as a, you know, a thing, but it is don't such a part of our, you have them. <laughs> exactly, or you have them too much. Um, <laughs> and so having that change is huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's really huge. Um, and, and so again, being able to work with a diversity of bodies using a diversity of force applications and diversity of intensities, um, means that I can help more people heal. Um, whereas, you know, it's easy to reach for, I have the, the solution and I just treat everybody with this one tool. Um, and that's, that's never quite it. Um, thanks to, thanks to TikTok, um, uh, I now have a business working remotely with people using like Zoom like calls um, where I'm coaching people through like doing their own self-care work. Um, and that's been, that's been really, really fucking cool. It's just so exciting because I can have people have really profound changes um, and meet them really where they are. Like, I can't leave my house right now, but you can help me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's part of the beauty of technology and also some of the frustration of how the United States are set up to a certain level with certain restrictions. So when you're yeah. consulting, you know, having that ability to consult <laughs> and support. We start every call. We start every first call with those clients with, I am not your chiropractor. I am a coach that you're hiring to teach you some body care techniques. Yep. Um, that is what I am. And so I cannot treat you like a chiropractor. I cannot advise you like a chiropractor, but I can refer to people who I think will be able to help you. And that was the perfect lead into my next question for you was yes, people who are listening that are like, oh my goodness, there are chiropractors out there like you. Do you have any keywords or anything when they're looking at their local chiropractors, bios or anything, what could or should they consider seeing that would show safety i i hate this question oh i'm sorry <laughs> i am no i hate this question because i don't have wonderful answers i have okay answers so here are things to look for particularly for hypermobile patients um it's a two-parter part okay. one is look on their website for low force or no force techniques there are a number probably a dozen or more chiropractic techniques that are super gentle that do not 
involve the cracking and popping movement, but that are really about a nervous system self-regulation. And so if you need help with that, that's that's a, the first thing to look for is low force and no force. Um, and those exist. Not everybody advertises the kind of technique or force that they use. Um, although a lot of the people who do low force techniques capitalize on the fact in their in their advertising that like there's no popping and cracking here because a lot of people are very nervous about the popping and cracking. Mm -hmm. The popping and cracking, by the way, is literally just gas getting released from joint capsules. It's a joint fart. It's cracking your knuckles. It's that's that's all it is. <laughs> I also, yeah, but when it comes from when the neck, that's like... your neck, it's it can be really scary before yeah. I adjust people's necks for the first time, especially if I'm using those higher velocity forces, I say, I will set them up. I will get them really close to it. I will set them back down and say, this is the one that makes people the most nervous most of the time, especially if I get the impression that they are getting nervous about it. So I want you to know you're in good hands and you're safe and I'm going to go as small as I can. There might be a noise. It might sting a little bit. It shouldn't really hurt. Okay. And then once they experience that, that's what happens. It gets safer and easier. Um, so for people who are hypermobile, that's the first really important thing is look for low to no force. And especially if you have a diagnosis like of Ehlers-Danlos, call them, insist on speaking to the doctor, not to the front desk and say, I would like you to tell me how much experience you have working with people with Ehlers-Danlos, for instance. And if they say, oh yeah, I see it all the time. It's no problem. I'm already nervous. But if they say, yeah, I've worked with several people. And when I do that, I completely adapt my technique around their connective tissue disorder. Boom. Great. Um, can I guarantee that anybody who says that is going to be able to do it? Well, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but, it, but it's a start. <laughs> there, there is no professional you can go to who simply by virtue of their title, you can count on being good. <laughs> so, exactly. uh, so, but that's, that's a really good start. Um, other things to look for, for people who are not necessarily specifically hypermobile, but just want a chiropractor who's sort of plays a similar kind of game that I do, uh, does similar kinds of work, um, look for trauma informed on their website. If it doesn't say that, mm, mm, um, you can certainly call them and ask them what their experience or thoughts about working with trauma are. Um, but I wouldn't know exactly what to tell you to listen for other than just like put your big listening ears on and listen between the lines. Um, Use your discernment, trust your instincts. Which again, particularly for our like, for the neurodivergent and specifically autistic people in the crowd might be very particularly hard. Um, yeah. So the last thing for the, the neuroqueer crowd is to call the office and ask them what they do with neurodiversity and what their thoughts about working with neurodivergent populations are. People with autism have very specific sensory issues and very specific to them sensory issues. And like, if the approach is we're just not going to change anything about the office in order to accommodate your sensory issues, like, so I have patients, like not super often, but occasionally I will just say, will you please stop the music so that we can focus? Because I usually have some music on in the background, but sometimes it's one sensory input too many, especially for my more neurodivergent mm -hmm. crowd. Um, and for, for people where it's not the sound so much, I have to be really thoughtful about how and where and when and how much I'm touching. And so, like we talked about with the brushing before, how this can really overstimulate a lot of yeah. people with three integration issues. Um, so same thing, if I'm feeling up your spine, I have to be kind of surgical, yeah. quick, precise, efficient. Like, okay, it's here. We're going to move this. You're going to shake it off. We're going to move this. You're going to breathe through it. And then you're going to go. Um, and I, so um, just having the savvy to tune into like, the fact that different neurodivergent populations have different sensory needs and different accommodations have to be made um, is something that we are not taught well in school, um, which is too bad, um, but is not such a complicated skill set to acquire if you're open to meeting people where they are and helping them. Thank you. Th those were amazing things to, to consider and look at. Because I hope it was succinct enough that it's useful. <laughs> yes, it, it was perfect. Absolutely <laughs> perfect. Um, so we're almost at time. If you could give, you know, one message to the listeners, and it could be about anything, not necessarily about chiropractor, but if there's one thing that you would just think would like the listeners to know and consider.
healing takes all different shapes. Um, healing is a non-linear process where things get better oftentimes by feeling worse at first. Um, and there are things to watch out for, especially in complementary and alternative healing, where for every super awesome, powerful, really well-informed healer, you're going to find somebody who like doesn't really know what they're doing, but has a really good story. And so in your own healing journey, you need to watch for two things at least to be happening. One, the story that you're telling yourself about how you're doing wants to become more and more positive over time. How I'm doing going from like, my life sucks to my life is getting better to I like my life. That has to be a part of the track. The other part though has to be like a little bit more grounded. And remember we talked, I talked before about the internal observer who's mm -hmm. focused on the subjective and the external observer who's focused on the, the objective. Um, every single one of my patients, every, every uh, you know, roughly 12 visits gets a report about how much their range of motion has changed, how much their various orthopedic and neurological tests have changed, what their posture looks like. Because in addition to, I feel different, I need, my behavior is different, my posturing is different, my function is different. And if you don't get both of those things, then you run the risk of just being in a cult where the important thing is to keep telling yourself that it's better and keep creating a more elaborate story of improvement. But if hands on the ground, things aren't changing except for the story. And that can be really hard to tell the difference between. But like, if you go to the doctor and say, I have arthritis in my hands, can you help? And they say, yes, um, or whatever healer it is. If you go and they say, yes, I can help the arthritis in your hands. And you go, wow, I'm feeling more and more spiritually open all the time. That's that's fine, but not if you're not also getting the arthritis better, Yeah, right? And it's really easy to fall into places where like, the practitioner accidentally or consciously and deliberately is redirecting your attention to a number of things that are more in the, that are exclusively in the, the spiritual realm. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, spirit healing is real, you know, but if it's not healing your body too, if it's not healing your mind and your relationships, if it's not healing something here in this world too, it's not really doing anything. Yeah. Because we are living, still having to live this life. So having yeah. that kind of yeah. scientific, tangible proof, not and not only, you know, as a signpost for yourself, but it also helps your conscious brain going, I'm making improvement. I'm doing the work and look what's actually occurring. Remember where I have a, a, a big beef with Rene Descartes? Yeah. And my dualism here with <laughs> Yeah. Right. Like if if both parts aren't changing, if the mind stuff and the body stuff aren't changing together, then we're missing something. Yeah. I agree 110%. That was fantastic. Thank you. Well, and if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, how would they be able to find you? Absolutely. So um you can follow me on a couple of socials, although I'm most active on TikTok at Dr. Sam Z, D-O-C-T-O-R-S-A-M-Z. Um that is also uh, my Instagram, I believe. Unfortunately, it's not perfectly unified. Um, uh, you can certainly go to my website, which is drsamz.com. Uh, and you can, uh, on my website, book appointments to come in and see me in person. Um, and if you go to linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E, -E, I think is how they do it, mm -hmm. slash Dr. Sam Z, um, you find a whole bunch of links to uh, practice videos that I post, uh, resources for patients, as well as booking appointments for in-person chiropractic care or remote coaching work to help you develop a toolkit for regulating your nervous system and feeling well. So you can find all of that at uh, my link tree, um, Dr. Sam Z. So that's, if you search for Dr. Sam Z, you'll find me. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Z, for joining me today. And- to the listeners, uh, like, subscribe, and follow. So thank you. For sure, for sure. And thank you so much.